All right, welcome back. Now we'll begin our next conversation. And this time our guest is joining us on Skype talking about uh, COVID-19, the guidelines NCDC has slated for Nigeria and how Nigeria should move forward uh, with the fight against COVID-19. So basically we're looking at the reality, the facts and the preventive measures um, of coronavirus here in Nigeria. All right, so we've been joined by our guest now from Abuja. All right. Head of risk communication, right? Yeah, so we have Dr. Yahaya Disu. Yahaya Disu is the head of risk communication division at NCDC. Great to have you join us on the program. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor. And good morning, Nigerians. All right, let's begin with the, the facts and fiction. Uh, fictions. A lot of Nigerians seem not to believe the existence of this pandemic, coronavirus. And in fact, uh, some Nigerians have refused to adhere to the guidelines, some of which is uh, daily washing of hands or frequent washing of hands, the use of face masks and social distancing. Now, now Nigeria hasn't, you know, as compared to other continents, Africa seems to be doing well in the fight against coronavirus. Virus. And looking at Nigeria, you, would, you could say that relatively, Nigeria is performing well. But some might disagree with the fact that we're not having enough tests done in Nigeria. But tell me, uh, what really is the situation? How is NCDC dealing with the testing of Nigerians for COVID-19? Okay, and, um, thank you very much for that question. And you would um, probably agree with me that um, when the index case was first reported in the country, we had only four laboratories, and then now we have 31 laboratories activated across the six geopolitical zones. And within a very short time, it shows the efforts government has put in place to ensure that uh, Nigerians have access to testing. And then, um, but um, to do tests uh, requires um, not just availability of the facilities, but uh, we also need uh, people to come out, or people who meet the criteria in our case definition, to come out for this test. So, uh, target for testing. So, and uh, I will only employ Nigerians, uh, particularly that meet the case definition. We are not saying every Nigerian should come for testing, because uh, if you look at the resources available, even globally, we cannot afford to test everybody. But we need to do this test for those who really need it. Sorry about that. Um, some connection issues there. But um, we'll try and reconnect with Dr. Yahaya Disu, who is the head of uh, risk communication with Nigeria Center for Disease uh, Control. Let him shed some more light on what the NCDC is doing in the enforcement of protocols and guidelines, especially when it comes uh, to the reopening of um, cities across the country. Oftentimes, uh, I'm sure you know, I, okay, looks like we have uh, Dr. Dishu back. Uh, um, samples, and then we now have um, over 12,000 confirmed cases. Okay. Uh, we have 12,000, are you still there? All right, Dr. Dishu, okay, okay, good. All right, so uh, you, you were the head of uh, yes, I'm there. Are you there? You were the head of Epi Surveillance, a pillar of African Union support for Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Are uh, you in Liberia to do a um, lot it's, of it's, great it's, things? I can't hear you. You are breaking. Oh, okay, can you hear me now? Hello, Dr. Yes, Jesus. I can. You can very well. You are not new when it comes to managing pandemics, epidemics, and what have you. For instance, you were the head of Epi Surveillance Pillar of African Union Support for Ebola Outbreak in Liberia, and you've done so many other things also in the country. What makes COVID-19 very different in the country, and do you think the authorities are taking it headlong? Sorry, I can't... Um, the, the last um, sentence you made, I didn't hear that. I want to compare what you've done, the jobs you've done personally as a risk uh, person that takes care of risk communications basically in this regard. What is different from managing Ebola pandemic when you, let me say epidemic, when you were in Liberia, you worked there, and what's happening in Nigeria right now? Do you think that the authorities have a hand on what is going on at the moment? 
Okay. Um, every outbreak situation requires specific approaches. And um, for instance, um, during Ebola outbreak, the main um, means of um, getting Ebola is by contact. Uh, contact with the persons who is sick or contact with the contaminated environment uh, like surfaces, objects, and so on. So, and they are similar, but in the case of um, COVID-19, it is respiratory. And so, uh, in, because it's respiratory, um, when you say respiratory, it's by droplet infection. And then, um, so it's a little bit more difficult than then when it comes to Ebola, uh, when it com it's compared to Ebola. Another fact that we may need to consider is um, for COVID-19, we have a number of asymptomatic transmitters, and then um, over 80% of uh, cases are mild to moderate, and then many of them are even asymptomatic. So, and then the, another thing is, um, before you, 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 you even know that you have it, you show symptoms, you're already transmitting heat. So it makes contact tracing very difficult. That is why uh, it's quite easier for this to spread across the world to become a global thing, a global challenge. Unlike um, Ebola, that was limited to communities, uh, states, and countries. So, and um, if we compare the two, uh, we know that it's easier to follow up with the confirmed cases and the contacts of Ebola when compared to uh, COVID-19. So, if that is the case, then we require the cooperation of the public. Every individual needs to take responsibility to ensure that uh, they uh, perform all the recommended guidelines, like a social distancing, um, um, use of face mask, and then also ensuring that they wash their hands frequently, and then they avoid the touching their noses or their face with their hands, because um, the way this virus is spread is either direct droplets that um, can fall on one's faces, and or the, the, the droplets that fall on the contaminated surfaces or objects that one may eventually uh, get in contact with. So the idea behind uh, using a face mask is, um, is a strategy for source control. If it's assumed that uh, everybody uh, may be carrying this virus because uh, we have a, a large number of asymptomatic transmitters, that people who carry this virus, who are transmitting it, but they are not showing symptoms. And figures from our analysis shows that uh, among the confirmed cases, about 63% of uh, these people are people who don't show symptoms. Yes, good, they don't show symptoms. It means they are fine. But uh, the risk there is they can spread it to the vulnerables around them. And these vulnerable are their loved ones. They are our fathers, they are our mothers, they are our sisters, they are our wives, they are our children. And so and we don't want to lose them. And we don't know what may happen to them when this happens. So that is why we all need to understand. And uh, with regards to the fact that I real. And I think um, before COVID-19 came to Nigeria, th there was this fear that, oh, because of what they see in other Yeah, Dr. Uh, Disu, we'll come back to you. We have sincerely apologized for the breaking transmission. We've been joined again via Skype by another doctor, Dr. Emmanuel Amoro. He is um, a, one of the frontline workers in the United States, although he's Nigerian. Good morning, doctor from Nigeria. Good morning and uh, welcome to the program. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You know, we wish you were here lending hands to uh, us in the fight against COVID-19, but all the same, you're also there saving lives. Uh, let's talk about some of the reality checks and um, the myths and facts and preventive measures of COVID-19. From the inception of COVID-19, we understand that you have been taking care of people uh, with COVID-19 even before they found out they had uh, coronavirus. We hear that it's... Um, even got worse in your state, Philadelphia, where, uh, where you reside. Now tell me, looking at um, comparison between the United States and Nigeria, uh, one could say that Nigeria hasn't recorded as much or as many uh, figures as the United States has. For you, would you say that the numbers we have in Nigeria is a reality, is the true picture of what's happening here in Nigeria? I mean, I don't think so personally, because it depends on how many testing have been done. Because right here in the United States, I believe we're doing a lot of tests. Uh, I can't really give you the amount the amount of testing we do daily, but 
uh, to be able to say that you have comparably the same amount of coronavirus, you have to do the same amount of tests, which I doubt they are doing that in Nigeria. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, Doctor Mora. Yes. Excellent. So, um, let, let me let me ask you this. I remember um, just when the outbreak of the coronavirus hit uh, the United States, and you know the back and forth between the Vice President Mike Pence and then authorities um, in the United States. This particular question, he, 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 uh, Mike Pence was asked, and he said he had feared that Philadelphia was going to be the center of the coronavirus outbreak in the United States. Uh, but months later, um, the picture, you know, I would love to hear from you what it looks like working right in the center uh, of, of the coronavirus in Philadelphia. Um, so I will say we got lucky because if you guys can remember, New York and New Jersey, they got the, they, they were really hit hard. So New York basically kind of led the way in the amount of cases they saw. And at that stage, we realized that we we're quite we we're quite close to them. So, the hospitals around here work together to actually prepare for the surge in patient care. And uh, my assumption is that because they increased the amount of testing, and also after experiencing what was happening in New York. At that stage, everybody was talking about ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We prepared for all these things. And at the same time, I believe the governor actually locked down the states beforehand. So I guess that's why we are lucky that we didn't get to the same state as New York and New Jersey. Right now, we actually have uh, the cases going down I mean, I, I, I think it's actually going down the last two weeks. And even where I work, uh, compared to the last, I'll say, three months, this is the lowest we've seen. So I think it's going down now. The current fear is that the current protest that is going on in the uh, United States will probably increase or will have a spike in cases. So, I mean, time will tell. In the next couple of weeks, time will tell if we will have more cases or not. I guess many people are really looking forward to that. I have a question for you on that, but right now we've been joined again by Dr. D. Su, who is in our Buja Studios, and he's a risk management expert. And let, let me ask you this question. Many people criticize the PTF for announcing, let's say the federal government being represented by the PTF, on the decision to take some protocols, management, uh, treatment, uh, announcements that they made to the people, for instance, lifting of uh, a ban on worship centers and all of that. You are a risk management expert. Did you actually take adequate cognizance of all the risks that could be associated with lifting such bans and the attendant effects that could come with it, possibly arise in the number of people who contract COVID-19? Uh, I, I got all you said except ban of what? Can you repeat that clearly? All right. The question basically is that many people are worried that the announcement of lifting of ban on worship centers and some other event centers by the federal government was hasty, especially when we're recording high numbers of people who test positive for coronavirus. Did you, for instance, as a risk uh, management communication expert, did you really, people are wondering if you actually took into cognizance all the effects that this could bring, should this lift uh, on this uh, ban of people coming together result into an increase in the number of people who contract coronavirus? Dr. Disu, are you there? Uh, I think we, we've lost his colleague. Okay, uh, we hope he will reconnect with us. Fortunate. Well, uh, let's head back to our guest in Philadelphia. Okay, this is back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Sir. Okay, are you there again? Mr. Disu, are you there? Yes, I can hear you. Can All you right. So, did you get the question? When the, oh, when yes. the process is um, well There are three through. factors we need to consider here. We need to consider lives, I mean safety of lives. We need to consider livelihood and which indirectly impacts on the quality of life. Uh, uh, we 
sincerely Imagine apologize for that. Away. That I don't know why that is happening when we're having this kind of nice conversation. But we hope to establish a clearer contact with Dr. D. Sude in Abuja studio. Let's head over to our Skype guest, Dr. Emmanuel Amoron, who is a doctor. He's a Nigerian, but uh, he's a doctor in the United States. Dr. Emmanuel. Hello. Yes. Yeah. All right, you have said that you don't think the reality in Nigeria, or the numbers we have in Nigeria is the reality we are facing. I want to know, as compared to the United States, what lessons do you think Nigeria can learn uh, from the practice so far? Uh, we have seen frontline workers uh, apparently being taken care of. We're not hearing no ventilators, as we used to hear earlier, or no PPEs. In Nigeria, we see doctors planning to even go on strike how do you think we can learn certain things from the United States in the fight against COVID-19? So we cannot really compare the healthcare system back in, in, in Nigeria. You can compare it to the United States. Uh, we have to start with that. And uh, based on, again, I won't say that I know how the healthcare system in Nigeria is because it's been a while I actually practice or did anything in Nigeria but from my own experience back uh, probably about 15 or 20 years ago uh, I cannot compare the healthcare system so I will say the most important thing Nigerians can do is mainly preventive measures I understood that the country was under lockdown for a while and I also understand that you cannot lock everybody in their house forever but in United States, which is the same issue, uh, initially most states advised everybody to stay indoor except essential workers. And they also advise anybody going outdoor to put on a mask. This way, if you're one of the asymptomatic career, you won't infect your fellow neighbors when you go out on the street. Also, we know that when you're in an enclosed space, there's a higher chance of transmission. So this is why it's even more important to put on a mask when you're in an enclosed space. And they suggested a couple of other things that uh, proper hand hygiene, just wash your hand regularly at least 20 seconds. Uh, when you are with uh, a friend, at least stay two meters away with a mask on. And if you actually feel sick, if you cannot get tested, it's probably better to self-isolate for about 14, uh, 14 days, if it's possible. So I guess if we implement all the preventive measures, we can help limit the amount of spread of the disease. Now, regarding the other issue when it comes to treatment and public health issue, I'm actually not familiar with how sophisticated Nigerian healthcare is, so I cannot answer that. But what we can do is at least listen to the uh, listen to the advice from you guys, listen to the advice on the news, and also maybe the public health should actually use the local leaders, the, the, the cultural leaders, because I, again, if I remember correctly, Nigerians tend to believe more in the local level. So if they can actually convince the local leaders to actually spread the news, maybe people will listen more. So again, I know the preventive measures work because if you compare uh, some of the Scandinavian countries, if you compare the cases in Sweden versus the neighboring states, uh, Sweden has more corona cases and they also have more uh, death rates compared to Denmark, compared to Norway. Why? Because Sweden never had a stay-home order. So, again, just looking at that country, you can tell that this works. So I just hope Nigerians can just uh, do their best individually to try and limit the spread of the disease. And uh, most of us in Philadelphia, if I go out on the street, I always wear a mask. So, I, I, again, I hope people do the same. You know, you know, Dr. Omoran, this is, a, this is first and foremost a health crisis globally and, and locally for the different countries where the coronavirus is mm -hmm. ravaging. Uh, the Nigeria's Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Osage Ehani, was recently interviewed and he talked about a number of issues facing the healthcare sector. We've got about 41,000 medical doctors 
in Nigeria today. Uh, a recent report did suggest that to beat this deficit, we'll need probably about 325, 350,000 medical doctors in the country. And if the, if the current um, statistics, statistics we're working with and the brain drain continues, we'll probably have to wait till 2100 to be able to meet the number of doctors required for Nigeria's population. That's if our growth rate doesn't exceed by 3, 3.5% in the next couple of years. What, what, what are your thoughts um, when he was asked, um, what are they doing about Nigerian doctors outside the country to get them uh, to help the Nigerian healthcare system? And he said, they're talking with medical doctors in diaspora to see how they can get them uh, on vacation um, in the country to, while they're on vacation to help the health sec sector, whether it's at the primary health care center or different centers. If you had a checklist and you asked the question what it would require to get people like you and people, uh, your, your colleagues in, outside this country uh, to get involved in revamping the health care sector, what will be your top three uh, requirements? Okay, I will answer this question by telling you why I decided to, to, to practice abroad. Okay, um, I remember, I can't remember, about 15 years ago, I worked in one of the federal hospitals as a visiting student because I did my medical school abroad. And I was surprised that most of the federal and state hospitals if a patient comes in, they have to be the one to go buy what is needed to get their treatment. And obviously, what I realized back then was people that actually use the, most people that use the federal hospitals can't afford the health care. So, meaning most of them are not getting the adequate treatment that is required. Now, if I was going to come back to Nigeria, which I am definitely going to come back eventually, uh, I will be hoping that the healthcare itself, at least they should equip the hospitals where most of the, the federal hospitals, because again, I give respect to all the doctors that work in Nigeria because I personally don't know how they do it <laughs> without the necessary equipment, without the necessary medication. I don't know how they do it. So kudos to them. Uh, but they need more support from the federal government. And also the public health in Nigeria needs, needs to be, you know, they, they need to do something about it. And also, I, I believe we're talking about even when the disease is there. Most Nigerians don't believe in prevent, preventive practices. That's another issue that I believe Nigerians need to take their health seriously. I, I Again, I don't want to pretend as if I know what's going on because I'm too busy here, but Again, just from my own personal experience, I just have the feeling that most people don't even take their health seriously. The, so, so there are so many factors involved, and I think, yes, the government has to be really involved and try to at least start with the federal hospital and the state hospitals to try and uh, make sure that we have the necessary medication, necessary equipment that is needed to treat patients and then also improve the public health sector. And I think with just those things, I, I, I will come on, you know. But right now, I, I don't know. Hmm, at least it's heartwarming to know that you, you've said that you're willing to come back home because we need people like you. We think at this point in time, we want to thank all our healthcare workers in Nigeria and over the world for risking their lives to save hours. We really, really appreciate you. So based on that one, there is a report that over 600 uh, healthcare workers had died uh, of coronavirus or have been affected many more. In fact, there was a, 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 a survey that over 90,000 nurses in the United States uh, being, have contracted uh, coronavirus. Now, how have you personally been staying safe, aside the fact that you told us earlier on that you do wear your masks? Yeah. So, I mean, 
every hospital have uh, different practices and in my hospital uh, we do have the personal the PPEs the personal protective equipment um, you have to assume everybody has coronavirus when you're meeting them so basically we in my hospital as soon as this started uh, they check our temperatures coming in everybody must have a mask everybody working in the hospital must have a mask on all the time except if you are in an isolated area alone also if you are going to see a patient you must have a face shield if you're going to see someone with confirmed coronavirus or patient under investigation apart from a mask and a face shield you must have a gown and a glove on and um, again the question about normal surgical mask versus n95 we follow the cdc uh, guideline which says you can just use a normal surgical mask unless if uh, some a patient is uh, on ventilator or getting aerosolizing uh, treatment so apart from that these measures since the beginning of coronavirus I would say has actually protected most of the healthcare workers that I work with. Yes, you do get occasional people get uh, that you work with with infection, but um, so far so good. We've been we've been fine in my in my hospital. I cannot really say how or why the other places, especially in New York, I will assume that they were not people were not aware that the uh, coronavirus was around at that stage, that there was a commu community spread at that stage. So my assumption is most of the infection probably happened at that stage. But again, this is just assumption. Okay. I cannot really answer why, okay. why this happened back then. All right, Dr. Moron, we'll come back to you again for your closing remarks. Uh, let's speak again with our guest in our Buja studio, Dr. Odisu. We'll come back to you, Dr. Moron. Dr. Disu, if you can hear us now, I'm hoping that the, the connection is better right now. All right, so. I hope uh, so. All right, let's talk about the case of the female COVID-19 patient who ran away or escaped from Imo State Isolation Center and she was found in a market's place in Ondo State. Uh, she was trading before she was moved back to the isolation center. Now, we know that in this instance, community transmission is expected. I want to know what the NCDC's approach to these kind of matters are or will be, knowing that this is not the first time patients are running away or absconding uh, from isolation centers. Okay. Um, and it's expected that uh, once in a while, we will have uh, patients that may not understand implication of what they are doing and then uh, that is just a tip of the iceberg and that is why um presidential tax force is um promoting an uh, all of society approach and uh, it requires um individuals to take responsibility to do what they can do to ensure that um they don't get this um disease and then in case they have the virus they don't contribute to its spread to their neighbors and uh, that means that we need to continue to educate people, uh, in particular, and promote a behavioral change. And that is why uh, influencers like religious leaders, uh, they have significant roles to play. Um, we have started uh, engaging them, having technical sessions with them, to ensure that um, they have an understanding of um, how this disease spreads and how it can be prevented, so that they know the principle behind uh, use of face masks, physical distancing and regular hand washing. And this is, we are doing this across the country and the MPCD is also engaging the traditional leaders and then especially uh, using the level that these people are educated. They are not just talking from position of authority, but they are talking from position of understanding where they can convince, uh, convince uh, their followers or their subjects on the need for them to comply with those measures. And also, the media are also critical stakeholders in this regard.
Definitely. Uh, we, we missed out on him again. Yes, it uh, looks like we had some net con connection problem. But we'll, we'll try as much as possible to get Dr. Disu back. Um, he's got several questions I'm sure people want to uh, find out. Uh, maybe we'll try one more time and see. Okay, Dr. Disu is back. Um, Dr. Yaya Disu, the head of communication, risk communications at Nigeria Center for Disease Control. Um, I think we can take one more question with him and then uh, let's hope we sail through uh, with it. Uh, Dr. Disu. Great. So this, this, ahead, is a, this is a very, um, this is a very um, strange period we live in. Uh, in the way we react because of the coronavirus, the economies and the way it is, uh, the reopening and all of that. Let me tell you why there's been a lot of skepticism and, and confusion in the way things are going on. Maybe you can help us explain better. So we're comparing notes with the United States, a wonderful doctor in the United States we're having conversation with, uh, with you, Dr. Moran, uh, who said certain things and um, who's put out certain guidelines uh, which the United States and all the Western nations have followed. And we've spoken to a correspondence in Nigeria and sort of thinking that a lot of what we're doing is playing by air. We've set standards, we've set timelines, we've set ceilings that we never met, never leveled the curve, and we've had cities being reopened, religious places being opened, uh, reopened, marketplaces being reopened, discussions on schools whether they're going to be reopened. Yet many of these guidelines that are supposed to have been set and met by risk management, risk experts like you, haven't been met yet. So, are we playing by air, a lot of things going on with the guidelines and protocols in the reopening of cities, or is this the Nigerian way in dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and the consequences? Okay, um, first thing is, um, initially, we didn't have much knowledge about this virus, how it moves, and we didn't know how exactly it's going to spread in our own client. But as we gain understanding, and confidence on how we can respond to the containment of this, I mean, to this outbreak, then we begin to see how we can adjust our lifestyle. But um, like I said earlier, it requires whole of society approach. The guidelines are set based on assumption. Assumption that uh, people will understand this, and then when they understand the risk they face, then they will be able to take their uh, complementary uh, 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 measures. But um, the, the issue, another thing is, um, because personally, I was talking to somebody in Barnett, and the person was, uh, I was saying, why are people not uh, complying with these guidelines? The person said he has not seen uh, people dying, so therefore corona is not really in Nigeria. I said, do you expect uh, to see people to die? Do you know the implication of that? Do you know who may die? It could be you. It could be your very close ones, your loved ones. And then when the person, the person said that uh, over is our dead body, it made me, why we are not getting that is, the lockdown, the measures that we have instituted, is actually working. But because Nigeria anticipated, and uh, they are going to see a lot of deaths, just like we have seen in Europe, and that is not happening, it means it's not here. Yes, it may be because um, some of these measures are working, and you see some Nigerians, they tell you they won't wear this, but when they have an um, opportunity to move close to somebody who may suspect, who may, they may suspect, and they will see that they want to abide by the guidelines. Um, we are very fearful, but um, issue of mistrust has actually been a long-term thing uh, with us. And the issue of misconception that, okay, uh, in our own environment because of our temperature, but this has been proven wrong. And other uh, climes where they have, they have the same similar weather with us, and then uh, transmission has been recorded or reported. And so uh, we need to continue to engage Nigerians to ensure that they understand this because um, the way they understand it will determine the way they are going to respond. And then also our healthcare workers, and then we, because um, polls that we have conducted uh, has shown that um, Nigerians are trust uh, uh, healthcare workers because uh, they, 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 they are experts in this regard. So if they don't have the right information about the disease, then they may not be able to inform the public uh, properly. So, um, just like what you are doing now, the media also has critical role to play in doing this. So I think um, the whole of society approach is what we need. The community leaders, individuals need to take responsibility, families need to take responsibility, and the government also need to play their role. 
And so this assumption, as time goes by, then we continue to learn more things about it and they adjust uh, the guideline. Uh -huh. The issue of compliance is for people to, be, to start resuming their uh, livelihood because uh, it either direct or indirect also impacts on the safety. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yahaya Dizu, Head of Risk Communications. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we've heard uh, from Abuja Studios, uh, Dr. Yahaya Dizu, who's the Head of Risk Communications Division at the NCDC, and has spoken um, all that we needed to know about the update on a coronavirus fight in the country. Still holding on, we have in the United States, Dr. Emmanuel Abmoro. Hello, doctor. Okay, is he there? Yes. All right, so there's this question. Uh, please do me this honors. Let me ask this question. A lot of people believe that there could be a kind of war against COVID-19 the United States is fighting even though they've been as open as possible that the world does not know. Is there anything you know that we do not know? I, I don't think so. I think that everybody has the same information. I mean, I will probably say one of the people that initially believed that the press was uh, exaggerating everything back in uh, January, but after my own personal experience with it, I think it was a appropriate response from the press. And I believe everything the press is saying about COVID-19, even though the information is evolving, because every day we have new information about the spread and the management of the disease. And I think and I believe the press is making the appropriate response by putting the information out there. So personally, I think we all know the same information. It's just left for people to actually take the responsibility to make the appropriate uh, changes to the lifestyle until we get a vaccine. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Emmanuel Lamoron from philadelphia u.s we are just five hours ahead of you so uh, thank you for staying up to talk to us on this segment and thank you for your time thank you thank you for having me all right we'll take another break and when we come back we'll take a look at some politics in edo state uh we'll take this short break and we'll be right back Say something. Yes, yes. We'll say no.